bring out a very special guest, you all. Um, I don't know, how many of you watched the city council meetings? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I love watching the city council, one, you know, because I want to know what's going on, you get the information, but I love seeing strong leaders. I love it when they care about us and they go in there and they fight for us. And this special guest that we're bringing out today is one of those people I love to watch on city council because she's always fighting for us, mm -hmm. always fighting for that transparency. Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. So without further ado, I'm going to bring, we're going to bring out <laughs> Alder Person and National Vice President of the Cities, League of Cities, which she'll come out and explain that she just got appointed, which is a huge deal. Uh, Claire Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Welcome, thank you. Claire. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yes. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. So tell us about this appointment you just received. So it's um, it's a, it's vice chair of the fair committee of the National League of Cities. That's a finance and administration intergovernmental um, committee. So relations committee. So that's what it's not not quite the vice president of the National League of Cities, but nevertheless a really important appointment, an important committee um, that I'm very proud to serve on. Um, that advocates for cities nationwide, um, looks for policies to help support our cities. So. I'm also a, on the board of the University Communities Council, which I'm also very proud to serve on, that looks at ways to build the relationships between universities and, and their host cities. Well, I can understand why you're part of the whole finance for the nation, because you break down the Evanston city budget with a fine tooth comb. Like you, you're like, why are we spending this much money on this? We're spending this on consultants. What are we doing? What are we doing? I love it. I love watching you break it down. I, I will say too, you come from a unique perspective. None of us here are, are elected officials and you are on the ground for a lot of these conversations and complex and you know often controversial conversations that we have here in the city of Evanston. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we just mm -hmm. touched a little bit about you know JLL contract and again that's Jones, Lang and LaSalle uh, you know, about that contract. Can you tell us a little bit about how we got here and, and okay, you know, we'll cut right to that yeah, chase. Yeah, okay, where, where we are right now. But I did want to sort of dovetail a little bit on your um, mentioning budget because really everything is so involved with budget and it's so important. Everything you know that really is the sort of the blueprint for our city's priorities and how we operate. So it's so important to be involved in the budget process and JLL definitely and where we've gone from there. Um, it has an enormous, enormous impact on our budget. So um, the JLL contract, um, so that came about back in October of last year and I was really broadsided by this. It was in a closed session, I think I can say this now because it's come out. Um, in a closed session, this was brought to us by staff, this idea of discuss, you know, directing, st directing our city manager to engage with JLL to go out and look at buildings to lease for the city. And we'd never spoken about this before, so I thought, wait a second, should we have this discussion first publicly um, to determine whether or not this is something that, that is of interest and, and, and necessary? Um, it really concerned me because I knew once we contracted with JLL, that ball, that train was going. And likely, next thing we know, we were going to be, you know, recommending moving the city out. And sure enough, that is what transpired very quickly. It came to just one special order of business, um, which really, really surprised me. Uh, so, yeah, and that was a no-bid contract. That was a no-bid contract. And yes, that was um, not ratified publicly. So when you make final decisions like that, you really have to bring those back. And it doesn't matter if there's money involved or not. Those final decisions have to be ratified publicly. And so that didn't happen. That was of deep concern to me. I'm glad that there was a resident who, you know, picked up on that in the media and, you know, doubled down to really make inquiries with the attorney general's office as to how that transpired. Um, so, so that should have been a bid contract. There's a lot of reasons that you want a contract like that to go out for bid. Um, the commission, for example, there's huge commissions involved in that. And a lot of times there's competition on commissions or how much they'll throw back at their client. When you're talking about such a large scale lease, um, again, commissions that well exceed a million dollars. So usually what I've learned is that 
you know, that is one of the things that they compete with. Well, we'll, we'll return 20% or 30%, sometimes up to 40% of a commission will be given back to the client. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, and there's the whole process of, um, anyway, there's a lot involved. And, and it, definitely, in my opinion, that should have been, we should have put that out for bid, and we didn't. When you mentioned mm -hmm. about the uh, giving back, um, back in my younger era, you know, they, they used to call that kickbacks which I'm not sure if that's exactly the same not, thing or what you're mm -hmm. discussing, but it's, you know, a, you know, a lot of different uh, associations of the use of words. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a, a young man versus now, it's uh, you know, like I mentioned about the, the need for transparency because mm -hmm. we, you know, um, backroom dealings are, are, are not the, the uh, normal Right. I don't think it's quite, um, so it sounds like, it, sometimes they call it throwback, but I think kickback is often done sort of, um, in an elite, it's associated with an illegal transaction, whereas this is something under the table. <laughs> under the table. And this isn't usually, so I did ask, I mean, I sent right out, I said, are we going to be, you know, has, has JLL offered any percent um, back to the city? Did anybody ask? And I just got a no for an answer. But um, that is, that's a little more par for course in terms of from my understanding, you know, when folks bid on contracts, that's some of the, the language that's in there. It goes back to the client, not back to an individual, but in this case, it would be the city. And we still don't know what the commission is. And that's, that's also a problem for me. I mean, we should know. We're the client. We should know what the commission is um, that JLL is getting from, I think it's called Red River, the, own, the property owner of 909. Um, and there's a reason for that. It could be a conflict of interest if you don't know. Absolutely. You want to know what they're getting. I can't, I'm still kind of stunned and shocked that um, we still don't know. I asked for that too. And I'm not saying it's anything, but this is basic information that you give your client. And right. so I'm a little bit surprised that, um, you know, that we, we haven't. We used to have the saying about can't tell the players without a scorecard. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so are we looking to purchase that building or are we just. So no, we, um, so JLL um, negotiated a 15 year lease, which is for our temporary relocation. If you ask me, there's nothing temporary about a 15 year lease. Um, it's a 15 year lease with a seven year opt out at $8.8 .8 million. So we're committed, you know, out of the gate, even if we decide not to go there after one year, upwards of $20 million. So, and anybody will tell you, like, right now, this is the weakest the office, you know, the market for office buildings has been in decades and decades. It's a tenant's yeah. market. So if we needed a short-term lease, that's available. Um, and so JLL brought back preliminary, what were called preliminary um, responses to an RFP for, for office space and these were supposed to you're supposed to take those then kind of negotiate and get a better deal well we didn't we just took you know here's the three responses and we went with what was in essence sort of the cheapest in terms of 15 year leases as opposed to saying okay we really need something shorter can we get something and you know negotiate back and forth i know rotary well there are there, there are options to go short term absolutely so um so this is i'm extremely concerned about this i think it's also yeah, so your question about are we going to buy it, you know, I thought I tried to work on damage control. Once we were committing to a 15 year, I would like to have seen this go out and get an option to purchase. At that point, if you get an option to purchase, um, you can protect your investment in terms of we're going to be investing upwards of $6 million in building out this building that we're only leasing. So an option to purchase um, is something that we could have negotiated. I'm sure we could have negotiated if we had said, listen, um, you know, we're only gonna, we'll only sign this lease if we can have an option to purchase, but um, there just wasn't the will <clears throat> to do that. So um, I'm certain, again, given the environment for office space, that that is something that would have been available to us, and that would have helped protect our protect our our investment. Yeah, and I, I, I want to add too. I mean, we're we're talking, especially with the show that we have right now about community engagement, mm -hmm. right, and participation in, in local government, um, and you know, going back to what Rojo was talking about earlier, the idea of kickbacks. If you as a resident are receiving limited information about a potential deal, right? You go and you read the paper and you say, wait a minute, the, the city just signed this 15 year lease. When did this happen, right? And this is the first time that you're hearing of it. 
and there's not a lot of information that's available to you as a resident and there's not when you ask those questions whether it's at city council to your elected officials and you're not getting an an answer uh, that's relatively in detail that leads to a lot of rumors circulating you have folks that believe well is is this a little bit more malicious with their intent uh, and when i do have conversations with elected officials and and we talk about you know, this this type of behavior by some folks that are in our community. And I, I try to push back and say, well, look, you've created an atmosphere where folks have to fill the void of a lack of information. Uh, and that can often be done with things that they hear from their neighbors, that they hear from other folks mm -hmm. in the community because there is that lack of information. And instead of just engaging the public from the beginning and saying, look, we envision having this 15 year lease because if we decide to renovate the Civic Center, it's going to take us X amount of years. Or if we decide to build a new one, it's going to take us X amount of years. That's why we have this set in place, et cetera, et cetera. That quells a lot of the fears that community members have. Mm -hmm. And it also builds that trust between city government and the people that they are elected to serve. Absolutely. I think part of the problem is it doesn't take 15 years to build. Like mm -hmm. I just in our ward where the old Burger King was, that went up in like a year and a half. Yeah. So I don't think that argument would work. Um, so I think there, the, you know, there could have been roadblocks. It, it, what it feels like to residents, and I will say to me, that there was this predetermined outcome um, that was happening without that open public discussion. Uh, so we, you know, had this discussion and closed doors about engaging with JLL. And then next thing we knew, I only found out a couple days before that we were actually voting on that, taking action on one of those leases. And so, and that happened in 45 minutes. So yes, to your point, when things don't happen publicly, a lot of questions, you know, people do start to think, well, what is going on? Why were we, why were we kept in the dark? Why didn't this come up through committee? Why weren't there discussions? So um, I think it's reasonable to be wondering. <laughs> Can you give us any type of indication? Because again, we're, we're leasing this mm -hmm. property. What's next in terms of the Civic Center? I mean, this is a building mm -hmm. that has been historic. I mean, it is mm -hmm. named after one of our strongest former mayors of Evanston, right? First black mayor of yes, yes. I mean, and this is a massive swath of land. So mm -hmm. what, what do we do next as a city? And how do we ensure that, again, the same issues that we've mm -hmm. seen now with with Ryan Field and the lack of community <clears throat> engagement there, mm -hmm. and and just the the lack of transparency around this JLL contract, how do we ensure that that, that doesn't happen again with with the Civic Center? So, I mean, that's a great question. With the Civic Center right now, I'm not sure, but I think a lot of it involves sort of a truth and reconciliation. Like let's let's really put everything on the table and understand why was this decision made to rush this through? There's no rush. What are the real costs in rehabbing the Civic Center? So I don't believe it, for us to remain there, that it takes $65 million. I think, I know there's a lot of government, from, from the National League of Cities, I know there's a lot of government grants right now, federal grants for reimbursement for installation of geothermal. We weren't given any of those sort of numbers in terms of real costs that we could have saved. And you know, I got into this, I had never planned a long time ago of ever being a council member, but because of the way the city was spending money that I didn't feel was really reflecting the interest, our interest here in, in protecting the city and protecting so that even you know, middle class people can remain here. And um, I just think you know, what we're seeing now is, you know, like I said, upwards of $20 million easily, if not 30 million with nothing to show for it. This is in rent. And could that money, imagine if we had taken that instead and invested it in the Civic Center, we'd have something to show for it, something. And that, uh, that amount of money, the taxpayers have to foot this bill? That's right. I'd be madder than the wet hen, I'll tell you that much. I'm frustrated, I'm very frustrated. Like I said, in the last ditch sort of um, damage control tried to you know, see if we could at least go out and get a, you know, the option to purchase, so at least we'd have that building if we're gonna invest that sort of money. Yeah. And, it, and, and you know, that building was bought under, I think it was um, being sold for in the 40 millions. It was bought by this um, this New Jersey firm for, I think around 27.8 million. And now it's so hard to lease these days. So as soon as you know our city manager signs that lease, now you got a 15 year lease with a very credit worthy 
you know, um, tenant for 15 years for 50,000 square feet, that just went way up, right? What he, they can turn around now and sell that for. For, I mean, way up. Yep. So over 10 million easily in, in a profit on top of what they bought it for, if not more. So, yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, I would have preferred that we had looked at the rotary at least. You know, they're a partner in our community. They pay, the, they actually pay property tax. Um, we know they're not going anywhere. It would be nice to have supported rotary, but I, but I still question whether we really needed to leave at all. And again, I'm always looking at that bottom line for our taxpayers. Um, people are struggling here. People want to remain here. People remain here. You know, they'll, they'll stay in Evanston, be house poor, or home poor just to stay in this lovely community because we all care about it so much. But it's getting harder and harder, and, you know, people are leaving because it's so costly. So, yep. I mean, the 909 building is a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in there, but I, I am concerned with um, how it's going to impact the residents in terms of the taxes. And it just seems so unnecessary. We're always rushing. Right. What's We're the always rush? rushing? I'm like, what is the rush? They rush to reparations. They rush to Robert Graham. They rush to. It's like always a rush, rush, rush. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that why we can never take the time to look at all options, different choices Absolutely. that's going to be best for the residents. But right. There is no reason to have rushed this. What's going?